next speaker, who's John Van Meerbeek, who we're very fortunate to have. Somebody did that. Where was that coming from? Anyway, um, we're very fortunate to have him come all the way from Belgium, where he's been very active in, in lung onco uh, thoracic oncology. Um, most, most recently, he's um, the director of thoracic oncology program at uh, Antwerp University Hospital, and has uh, been very active in the, in the intergroup uh, intergroups uh, in, in Europe, in particular the EORCT, where he's been the secretary chairman and, and a board member uh, and is very active in running clinical trials uh, through that mechanism. Uh, he's, he's actually a, um, a trained internist and pulmon pulmonology person who is an interventional pulmonologist uh, by training. And uh, in this country, it's a little more unusual to have pulmonary people very this active in, in our area, but it's certainly it's certainly a, a welcome uh, specialty to have involved with cancer, both of the lung and mesothelioma. Um, so uh, in kind of finding a new, new treatments that are gonna be coming up in the future, one of the things about thoracic oncology is more personalized care based on genetic factors and targeted therapies and, and uh, more biologic therapies in the future rather than just kind of toxins like chemotherapy. And so uh, Dr. Mirbeck, who's got a PhD and MD, is going to give us an update on what potential targeted therapies and where we're going in the future in terms of all these uh, new treatments that we've heard for other, other kind of cancers, too. <coughs> so welcome. Yeah, this goes forward. This is a big huge laser pointer. OK, uh, thank you. Thank you for introducing me, Dr. Cameron. And also, thank you for inviting me to come to attend this uh, prestigious meeting. Uh, actually, I uh, did not come specially from Belgium. I was at ASCO meeting till, um, till Wednesday. So, um, Dr. Cameron asked me to give a um, state of the art of targeted therapy in mesothelioma, so that I will not do, because that will take me at least uh, two hours in order to review that. What I will do is just give you an insight of what is new in uh, targeted therapy. So we will leave the uh, operable uh, mesothelioma, I will speak of advanced or inoperable mesothelioma. The other issue is that my review will hence not be uh, comprehensive. I will only stick to those uh, uh, issues that are, I think, of uh, interest because they are, they are new. And that is also the reason that my handout is not representing the slides that I will pre uh, present. Um, because obviously at the ASCO there were some new data presented. So having said that, uh, these are my disclosures. And um, I would like you to... Um, to have this uh, learning uh, objectives with you so that you should be able to understand some of those new insights in the genetics and the biology of mesothelioma to describe how a rational um, th how rational targeted therapy should be designed in the future and list some potential um, therapies and uh, trials in uh, development so the um, uh, treatment paradigm for inoperable mesothelioma, as you undoubtedly know, is that at diagnosis, patients are given first-line treatment. This consists of uh, platinum antifolate, antifolate doublet, four to six cycles. About 40 to 60 percent of patients have uh, disease control with this regimen. Then we use to watch and wait till progression occurs, and then patients are retreated in second line, either a re-challenge with um, platinum antifolate or a second line treatment with single agent phenorelbine or gemcitabine. Uh, about one third of the patients are refractory to this treatment and obviously those one go immediately to second line although um, the results in this uh, fraction of patient is usually disappointing. And then there is a third, um, a third uh, treatment uh, modality that has come over from lung cancer care is the so-called maintenance. And this is definitely not a standard treatment nowadays, but I think uh, here and there some people do that. So they give a maintenance antifolate until the patient progresses and then he proceeds to the second line treatment. So this is the, 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 the present paradigm. And how do we add targeted treatment to that? Well, we, you can add that in the first-line treatment. You have to add that to the chemo backbone. Yeah? So it is uh, the 
target the treatment added to chemotherapy. Regarding maintenance and second line treatment, you can either give a single agent uh, or single agent versus placebo or versus um, the single agent chemotherapy. So that's the, the paradigm uh, uh, which, which has uh, to change and that will become more clear in the, in the, following, in the following slides. So we don't have to forget that even our antifolate treatment is a targeted treatment, perhaps the best targeted treatment we have for the moment, as it targets um, uh, three different enzymes of the folate mechanism. The folate is important in DNA sy uh, synthesis, and we know that uh, permetrexate, for instance, targets all three. Huh? That's why it was called previously MTA, multi-toxic uh, antifolate, instead of multi-target antifolate. Uh, and uh, raltitrexate, uh, the, the agent that I investigated in the past, uh, only acts on the, on the TS enzyme itself. But we'll come back on that later on. Okay, so what is a targeted treatment? For those of you who are not aware of the, um, the, the definition, so it's a, it's a therapy with a specific molecular target that should attack a biologically important process, preferably one central to a, hall, a hallmark pathway of cancer. And I'll come back in the next slide to the definition of a hallmark pathway. And that target should be measurable, and then comes the definition of a biomarker, eh? And um, the measurement of the target should be uh, correlated, should be um, correlated with a clinical outcome when the treatment is administered. And the whole effort obviously is done to improve the therapeutic window, to have more efficacy and less toxicity than um, the cytotoxic agents. So um, the hallmarks of cancer are undoubtedly known to you. This is um, a landmark article that was published, I think, about the first time, about 10 years, and then a new edition uh, three or four years ago. And you're certainly aware of those 10 landmarks in um, the cancer development that goes from uh, uh, sustained growth, um, evading growth suppressors, angiogenesis, immune destruction, etc. We come, we come back to that because I propose to use this scheme as the background to go around um, for the, the new, uh, new evolutions in targeted, um, in targeted treatment. So let's start with um, sustained proliferative signaling and evading growth suppressors. Then you certainly are aware that um, there are a lot of um, um, pathways, growth pathways that are overexpressed um, by immunostochemistry, and this is due to the presence of uh, receptors on the cell surface, of the, uh, the tumor cell surface. And you have uh, uh, receptors for EGFR, VEGF, FGF, uh, IGF, PDGF, uh, and uh, AGF. Uh, and you know how the signal proceeds, so you get a ligand. The ligand uh, triggers the receptor to dimerize, and then there is um, a tyrosine kinase that binds to the... Um, uh, th that gives a signal to the downstream uh, docking proteins, etc. That brings a signal to the nucleus. Eh? So this is certainly well known to you. Um, so several of these receptors are overexpressed in mesothelioma, and uh, that correlates with a poor prognosis. We have had several molecules developed against those receptors, not only for mesothelioma, but more specifically also for lung cancer and other types of cancer. I will not name them. You certainly recognize most of the names that end up NIP or TNIP uh, on the slides. And you have to realize that these work only on the intracellular um, receptor ty uh, tyrosine kinase, whilst uh, monoclonal antibodies target the extracellular receptor. And there are two of them of interest, cetuximab and sixotumumab, um, which are di uh, directed against... Um, the respectively the EGFR receptor and the um, IGFR receptor. Okay, um, the molecules have been extensively tested uh, in mesothelioma uh, and um, one of the uh, repeating um, weaknesses of the trials that were conducted in the past is that this, those trials were done uh, mostly as single agent, single arm phase two trials in pretreated patients and without target selection. So it's not, um, uh, it is not surprising that those results have mostly been disappointing. For those of you who want to know the story of all those um, TNIPs and NIPs in mesothelioma, I can uh, just um, recommend to read the, treat, uh, the, um, the review in the cancer treatment review that was published last year by um, the Spanish author Ramon. So um, 
growth pathway disappointing. Let's leave it. <laughs> Nevertheless, um, there are ongoing trials um, in growth pathway with different molecules. You see them listed uh, on the slide, um, either with or without chemotherapy, targeted against uh, no numerous uh, different targets in phase one, phase two, in pretreated and, and first line. But what you also see is that only one of these trials, there is a preselection done based on uh, expression of the receptor. In all the other ones, all comers uh, are admitted, so there is no target selection um, for these uh, for these trials. So the odds are that most of these trials will be not contributing and will not be uh, positive. So let's um, move to uh, another and a new and a very promising and fashionable um, to hallmark, that's the cancer immunotherapy. The drug of the years and the breakthrough of the years as it was also claimed at the uh, the last ASCO meeting. So I, you will hear a lot about this uh, immunotherapy this afternoon when speaking about vaccination, so I will not address that issue. I will just address uh, two short um, um, posters and, and uh, uh, trials that were presented at ASCO. The first one regarding the so-called CTLA-4 therapy. So as you know, um, um, the antigen presenting cell huh, has to activate the T cell, and thus this happens through a connection with two receptors and, 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 um, and, and, and antigens that is blocked, that is paralyzed by the presence of this CTLA, uh, which, connect with, which, uh, um, which connects also between the T cell and the antigen and paralyzes the activation. So when you give a monoclonal antibody that blocks that CTLA-4, um, it is hoped that the that the that the T-cell activation can be restored and that um, the T-cell can start killing the tumor cell. So um, a phase two trial with a CTLA blocking antibody, trimelimumab, which is a parent drug to ipilimumab, which is known to you in um, uh, melanoma treatment, was um, published last year. And you see there were two um, partial responses and, and nine stable disease, so a disease control rate of about 30%. And at ASCO, another, uh, the same group published um, another series um, with another regimen, so a, a four-weekly regimen instead of a, um, a three-monthly uh, three regimen. And they also had a, a quite impressive um, response rate. So definitely this drug is now being tested in a randomized um, phase two uh, um, design trial versus placebo in pretreated patients. But unfortunately, uh, they do not select or stratify for the expression of CTLA-4. So uh, this could perhaps be a weakness of this uh, trial design. Uh, the other um, molecules and um, uh, drugs of interest are obviously the PD and the PDL1 antagonist. So you uh, realize that also here the T cell is uh, paralyzed in the, uh, in the tissues. So this, is, this happens mostly in the tissue. The CTLA-4 happens mostly in the lymph node. So the tumor and the, t the tumor lymphocyte interact with each other through um, a, a receptor and an, and, an, and an antigen. And this, um, uh, this interaction blocks the T cell. And so the idea is to inhibit this um, um, receptor, this PD-1 or PDL one receptor, by giving, by uh, putting uh, monoclonal antibodies which block these um, receptors and restore the tumor T cell activity. <laughs> so what's the status of uh, PD and PDL one in mesothelioma? Um, at uh, the last meeting in uh, April or in, in March of the European Lung Cancer Conference, a group from, um, I think it was from my, the Mayo Clinics, presented the data in 224 mesothelioma specimens and showed that 40% of them expressed PDL1 and almost all of these were sarcomatoid uh, subtypes. So this is definitely of interest. Eh? So the epithelial subtypes do not express that much PDL1 and this was also in, uh, associated with poor survival. So a couple of days ago, Heidi, Heidi Kindler, whom you certainly know, presented data based on 44 um, samples, mesothelioma samples, and she showed that uh, in these uh, uh, samples the there was a so-called so T-cell inflamed phenotype, as uh, was also seen in melanoma cases, uh, which could predispose to uh, successful introduction of PDL1 treatment. And um, recently on the internet, I saw this uh, message appearing that the first tri trial with PDL1 will soon be launched in, um, 
in the US. I think it's the group of Denver who will, who will, um, who will start that, uh, that trial. So definitely um, to be uh, followed up and definitely promising. The next hallmark is um, invasion and metastasis. There, I think uh, you certainly are aware of the mesothelin molecule, mesothelial molecule, which is a, a differentiation antigen, which is found on the, uh, mostly on epithelial cell, not only, only also on, on some other um, healthy cells, but definitely on mesothelial cells. It has a rule um, and a role in malignant invasion. And so you know that when it splits uh, and it, it comes into the blood, it is used as a biomarker of response in mesothelioma treatment that is even... Um, has even been F FDA approved. So how can you tackle that um, mesothelin uh, antigen? Uh, there are a couple of ways. The most, um, the, the, the most well-known is the so-called amatuximab, which is a, a chimeric monoclonal anti-mesothelin antibody, which has been tested by, at the NCI by Rafid Hassan, who presented the data a couple of years ago with promising, um, um, promising results, partial response, 39% stable disease, 51%, so this is a very uh, high um, uh, and promising uh, disease control rate. Uh, and with relatively few um, hypersensitivity reactions due to the chimeric nature of the monoclonal antibody. He promised me that the phase three was planned um, and, and would be ongoing, multinational uh, phase three. Uh, my question is, will there be any selection uh, based on biomarker um, expression or stratification, so that uh, was still unclear. Another way of uh, tackling the mesothelin is using an immunotoxin, the so-called SS1P, which is a recombinant um, uh, anti-mesothelin immunotoxin. Phase two data have also been presented with a partial response rate in 50%, which is also a very promising. So definitely also, um, something to look at and any further investigation. We go further, another, another um, hallmark that has been extensively investigated in the past is the uh, angiogenesis. So you're certainly aware that you can interact with angiogenesis on different levels. You can interact with the ligand, um, that's uh, when you use bevacizumab for instance, but also thalidomide has been thought to interact with the ligand. You can interact with the endothelial cell, uh, by giving so-called um, vascular disrupting agents or drugs which um, kill the, um, or, or force the endothelial cell into apoptosis by the ext extrinsic pathway. And this is what is done with the so-called tumor necrosis factor. Um, unfortunately, as you certainly know, um, the scoreboard for anti-angiogenic uh, treatment in mesothelioma is rather poor and disappointing. And this is certainly driven by this randomized phase two trial that was done by the CLGB, uh, in which gemcitabine cisplatin um, was given together with uh, bevacizumab or placebo in patients with malignant mesothelioma as first line treatment in all comers. Mm. Once again, this, was, this treatment was done in all comers and after that, uh, in the subgroup analysis, they showed that the treatment, that um, the TGF, uh, sorry, that um, the level of vascular endothelial growth factor expression was perhaps a prognostic factor in those with a, with a low median, um, a low median uh, level did better than the high median level. But unfortunately, they did not split it out according to the, the treatment given. This, this is based on all, uh, all patients of both arms. So because of small numbers, they could not split it up in patients um, receiving either uh, GCB or so bevacizumab or no bevacizumab. So the odds are against angiogenesis and the, hopes, the hopes are now all on the, uh, the, the, the French phase three trial that has uh, finished its accrual and that I think will be presented at the ESMO meeting uh, this fall or either uh, the, the other ways, perhaps at the IMIC meeting also in this fall. And so in this tri uh, trial, it's a randomized phase three trial the phase two trial was, um, the data of the phase two trial were promising, so they continued in a phase three trial. Uh, it is, um, the treatment is cisplatin permetrexed with bevacizumab. There is no active placebo given. There is no crossover allowed, but once again, uh, and unfortunately, there is no biomarker defined as, as there is no valid biomarker for angiogenesis for the moment. So I'm rather skeptical whether this trial will show, but let's hope and let's see whether this will um, come true. Um, a third um, way of interacting, as I mentioned, is the so-called human tumor necrosis factor. 
you know that uh, the TNF alpha is very uh, toxic and very active. It's a very powerful drug against um, the um, cancer cell, but very toxic unless you fuse it, you bind it, you conjugate it with another peptide, the so-called NGR TNF alpha, uh, which um, at that moment attacks the um, uh, CD13 uh, um, receptor on the surface of the endothelial cell and force the endothelial cell into apoptosis. A promising phase two trial has been uh, published a couple of years ago by an um, Italian, uh, Italian uh, UK group in which a disease control rate of 46% was um, described. And as you probably know, there are now two ongoing trials um, with this drug, uh, one in the so-called maintenance setting and the other one in uh, second line. I think this, the trial in second line has been as completed its accrual and will also be presented this, um, this fall at the, the ESMO meeting. But once again, uh, um, also in this trial, there was no target preselection done. Uh, so it were all, comers, uh, were, um, uh, all comers were allowed to, um, to, to enter the, the, the study. Ne the next hallmark, genome instability and mutation, obviously, um, this is also a topic of, of great interest and of um, great promise. Um, there are, for the moment, two series of um, um, mesoteliomas that have been sequenced and whose uh, which data have been, uh, have been uh, presented are in the public domain. The first one is the, uh, the, the group from Memorial, S Memorial Sloan Kettering. It's in the upper panel. And at last ASCO meeting in the Italian group led by Giorgio Scagliotti presented its data based on 123 tumors versus 53 for the, the, the US data. What you can see from this panel is that um, there are some mutations, uh, the red ones, but most of the alterations are um, allelic loss or inactivation, the blue one, the dark blue ones, and those one cluster in three genes, the BAP1, the NF2, and the, CKD, C, uh, the CDKN2A. Uh, so these are uh, tumor suppressive, mostly tumor suppressive genes or silenced genes, and these are activating uh, oncogenes. And you see that they are um, very rare and um, uh, they do not often occur in mesothelium. And the same comes out from the the Italian series, uh, in which also BAP1, NF2, and CKT uh, are the more prevalent um, alter molecular alterations in mesothelioma. So this brings us to an important um, dilemma and issue in mesothelioma is that there are no driver mutations. There are no oncogenes, uh, or there are very few oncogenes in mesothelioma, which are the better ones to, to have. Uh, because uh, oncogenes, uh, you, th these are so-called driving mutations, they are druggable. Uh, we have a good record on that. Uh, if you look at, for instance, uh, the EGFR, the KRAS, the BRAF, all successes in the, recent, um, in the recent past, all successes for the treatment of oncogenes with so-called targeted, uh, targeted drugs. But we don't have them, and we have to live with suppressor genes uh, in mesothelium. So genes that have been either silenced, deleted, inactivated, methylated, etc., and which are not easily druggable. Eh? And here, instead of um, targeting the, the gene, we will have to target the effector pathway. So let's see what is available on that. As mentioned, there are so these are the common regions of allele loss in mesothelioma. So on the 3P21, there is the BRCA-associated protein, which is inactivated or has a genomic loss. And as you certainly know, there have been a number of um, germline mutations also associated with um, uh, some rare tumors as renal cell carcinoma, cholangiocarcinoma, and uveal melanoma. So definitely there is something, something going on there. Then 9P21, uh, that's the gene that which codes for the P16 protein and also for the CDKN2A, which is mostly um, uh, inactivated by deletion or methylation. Methylation plays at the level of the epigenomics, and I will not come in details on that, but that's where, for instance, the um, Vorinostat um, uh, comes in, in picture, a trial which was unfortunately also negative in second line. But I will not discuss that. I will mostly focus on the NF2 genomic loss because that's the most prevalent of the three, about 66% uh, of the tumor samples. And um, which, uh, what are the consequences of NF2 genomic loss is that it unchecks the mTOR signaling pathway. And the mTOR signaling pathway is an important pathway because it links 
our growth receptors with uh, the nucleus and with the apoptosis uh, translation and, and um, uh, cell cycle regulation. But this is an important pathway. Um, and um, when you uncheck uh, the mTOR, this can result of these results in uh, unlimited, uh, unlimited growth and, and, and further uh, malignant transformation. Um, fortunately, um, there are a couple of possible biomarkers for the mTOR. Um, when you have um, uh, NF2 loss, hmm, your phospho mTOR is highly is overexpressed, and this could be uh, uh, useful for selecting patients for targeting um, targeted mTOR treatment. Um, unfortunately, a trial with Everolimus has been uh, conducted by the SWOC and, and presented a couple of years ago, but this was once again in unselected patients. Uh, they strike again, uh, so there was no uh, selection done of patients. Obviously, they did not know perhaps about the NF2 um, loss at that moment. And uh, the only thing is that uh, besides selecting patients, the way forward could be in using the so-called dual inhibition. Right? You have to realize that um, if you go to, um, to this slide again, if you, if you inhibit only mTOR, uh, uh, the other pathways, which are driven by um, phosphoinositol kinase, are also, in, uh, also activated. So you, you just you bypass the mTOR by this pathway. So that's the reason why a dual inhibition with a drug which also hi uh, hits the PI3K uh, could be useful. And two drugs have already been um, are in development, uh, GDC0980, uh, uh, which has shown a partial response rate in an expansion cohort uh, of a phase one trial, which you see here. These are the blue, um, uh, the, the, the blue bars are the ones with a P10 and a an, uh, PY3K uh, mutation. And then a uh, Lily compound is also in development presently in phase one. So they could perhaps um, trigger um, uh, promising results in those patients, provided um, you develop them in um, selected patients based on the expression of a biomarker. Okay, the other good thing on NF2 loss is that it, it is associated with inactivation and loss of Merlin protein. And Merlin protein is another important protein which uh, is in the, in the cell present and which, is, uh, which plays a role in cell adhesion, invasion, cell motility. And this also partially through a regulation of the so-called focal adhesion kinase, the FAC. Hmm? The focal adhesion kinase is... Uh, and, and, and another it's not a tyrosine receptor kinase, it's an intracellular kinase in the cytoplasma which regulates um, signal transduction between the integrins and growth factor receptors. Huh? So when your Merlin is inactivated, this leads to increased FAC expression, increased spreading and invasiveness of the, of the tumor of the, of the cell. So definitely Merlin and FAC are um, targets of interest. And uh, there are currently a number of drugs that have been developed. Uh, there are two FAC inhibitors under investigation, the GSK compound and the defactinib or the VS or Verastem compound, of which you've certainly heard. Hmm? And um, in, um, in a phase two trial that was um, presented a couple of, I think last year, uh, the investigators showed that um, the defactinib worked preferentially or worked better in Merlin negative patients, so the ones who had NF2 loss instead of the Merlin positive patients who did not have NF2 loss. So definitely um, NF2 status could be a valuable stratification factor. And what the investi investigators also showed is that um, this um, FAC inhibition uh, worked also uh, quite well in uh, cancer stem cells where pemetrexate, so chemotherapy, was not uh, very active anymore. So you're certainly aware of the so-called command study where defactinib is given as a maintenance treatment after first-line chemotherapy. It is given in uh, all comers, huh? but they have to be stratified. So you have to, to know the Merlin status, huh? and uh, according to um, the Merlin low or high status, patients are stratified and treated with either placebo or the active compound. So this trial is currently ongoing and open, and you're certainly encouraged to participate uh, because they're still they're lagging, lagging behind um, in, in, in accrual. So the last um, hallmark that I want to present is the cellular energetics. Um, so the regulation of the cellular energe energetics. And um, I will just uh, mention one trial that was presented at last ASCO, and that is a so-called ADAM trial. So you have to realize that um, cells live on arginine. 
Arginine is an essential amino acid, um, uh, which the, um, the cell makes out of um, um, other proteins, etc. Uh, by, by the use of the enzyme arginine succinate. Eh? Succinate, that's the enzyme that makes the arginine. Hmm? Um, if this enzyme is la lacking, eh, the cell has to retrieve the arginine from the blood. Uh, it has to import it through the cellular membrane. Hmm? And if you, at that moment you give a compound which um, destroys, which um, which um, metabolizes the arginine in citrulline, for instance, the cell will not have arginine, and as it is an essential amino acid, the cell will die. Yeah? So this is the mechanism against the so-called arginine deprivation treatment, which is very old. It was already given in the treatment of uh, acute uh, leukemia in the, in the 50s of last, uh, of last century. So this is the basis of uh, the, tri the, the trial that was uh, done, the so-called ADAM trial, so in which patients were first tested, so they had 214 patients tested for the status. About one-third um, uh, did not express the arginine synthase, and those patients were uh, randomized between best supportive care. It's a UK trial. Uh, and um, the administration of ADIPEC, uh, which stands for ar arginine deiminase, in a pegylated form. So this is a drug which metabolizes which, um, the, the, the free arginine in the blood. So in this randomized trial, the data were presented um, a couple of days ago at the ASCO meeting, and they were quite surprising because they showed that there was uh, a, a, a surprisingly significant difference in um, progression free survival in favor of the patients treated with the ADIPEC compound compared to those who were treated with best supportive care. They did not observe any partial responses, so only disease control, but the, that was enough to, uh, to have this uh, median progression-free survival um, of 3.2 months in the combination, in the ADIPEC arm versus two months in the best supportive care arm with a hazard ratio, have a look, a hazard of 0.51. Uh, so this is a very... Um, significant um, result. When they looked at the um, uh, degree of um, ASS loss, uh, so this typically is um, uh, a low, um, a low uh, at immunostochemistry, a low presence of ASS, and this is complete absence of ASS, complete loss of ASS. So you see that um, there is definitely in those patients who have um, uh, uh, very high, so in, in which the loss of ASS is very high. So in, in this group, uh, the, the difference between uh, the administration of ADIPEC versus best supportive care is even better with a point, uh, hazard ratio of 0.27. So a highly significant um, advantage, survival outcome advantage, it, I think it's progression-free survival in favor of administration of ADIPEC in, in uh, those patients uh, treated with ADIPEC and with a very low content of arginine synthase. So the next step is that um, this trial will be followed by um, uh, the TRAP trial in which the compound is associated with um, cisplatin pemetrexate as uh, uh, chemotherapy backbone. So I come to my um, conclusions. Are we on target? Yeah, unfortunately, not yet. Hmm? We, have very, we have many targets, but we have few validated biomarkers. Hmm? And unfortunately, a lot of our trials are copycat trials from lung cancer or other tumors, but lack uh, rational trial design. The odds are against targeting growth receptor and angiogenesis, angiogenesis pathways, and we certainly should look forward to the immunotherapy and uh, uh, genomic-driven um, um, treatments which I presented. Pathog pathogenesis remains the clue for the understanding of the biology of the treatment. We have still several um, hallmarks and pathways which we can uh, explore, and we have novel agents with a strong biological rationale. And I just will mention a number of um, hallmarks that we did not discuss, and of which are is limited or no um, research done in mesothelioma regarding the rep, um, enabling the um, uh, replicative immortality, so by the use of telomerase inhibitors, tumor promoting inflammation, so the use of selective anti inflammatory drug, and then the pro apoptotic pathway, which is um, hardly explored in mesothelioma. We also don't, uh, uh, we also have not to forget how 
asbestos works in mesothelioma. Eh? You see this, uh, the, the, the pathogenesis of asbestos. It goes through this, uh, to NF kappa beta, which is a, 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 trans a transduction factor between the cytoplasma and the, and the nucleus. And certain drugs uh, have been shown to work specifically of on NF kappa beta, like bortezomib, Velcate, a drug that has been explored in some trials in mesothelioma and which could be of, um, of interest. And finally, closing the circle, um, we have perhaps to look again at timidylate synthase. And this um, data from, uh, also from the group from Scagliotti showed that those patients who have a low TS expression do better than the ones who have a, a high TS expression. So definitely we should perhaps uh, look at SNPs and, uh, and, and, and other um, uh, genes related to the metabolism of pemetrexate and of, the, and of the folates in order to improve the patient selection for standard chemotherapy. So, um, take home messages first, paraphrasing one of your um, ex-presidents, it's all in the biology. Hmm? Uh, the future lies in uh, rational designed trials, and once again, as I mentioned in the, in, at the beginning, uh, we should certainly uh, include a biomarker, a measurable target, uh, as an as a inclusion criteria for participation and not as a post hoc analysis. In first line randomized phase two trials where the eye agent is added to the backbone are to be preferred. In pretreated patients, we, you can do randomized or single arm phase two uh, um, proof of concept trials. And I can only advocate all of you to enroll your patients, preferably only in such trials. Thank you very much. <laughs>